Good morning. Buenos días a todos y a todas. On behalf of the University of Illinois System, I thank all of you for your participation in this symposium organized by the University of Illinois Mexican and Mexican American Student Initiative. We call it IMAS. President Kalin says there is always more to do, right? I must que hacer. I thank the president of the University of Illinois System, Dr. Timothy Kalin, for his leadership and enthusiasm recognizing the need and the opportunity that IMAS presents. Good morning, colleagues and friends of the University of Illinois Chicago. Good morning, University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Good morning, University of Illinois Springfield. A special welcome to students and to distinguished authorities from different institutions. My name is Elvira de Mejia. I'm the director of the IMAS program. This is a University of Illinois initiative, system initiative. I welcome, I welcome all of you to the second international symposium on mental health. You know, IMAS represents a culture of support building pipelines for Mexican and Mexican-American students, smoothing the path and retaining the most talented students as possible, building a network of collaborators. IMAS is about partnering in collaboration with our peers in Mexico. IMAS will enhance ongoing efforts by the system's three universities to expand Mexican and Mexican-American students' educational opportunities. I thank all authorities and representatives of different institutions for their presence and support, especially Ambassador Reina Torres Mendivil, Consul General of Mexico in Chicago, Dr. Amalia Payares, Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Engagement, and Tania, Tania Cabrera for their uh, support, continued support, Dr. Margarita Terán de Jesús García Gasca, the president of the University Autonomous of Querétaro in Mexico for her continued support and for so many years of successful collaborations. And Dr. Neil Macrillis, vice provost for global engagement, University of Illinois, Chicago, for his support. On behalf of IMAS and the UI system, I thank all the speakers for their meaningful and engaging presentations. I hope this will spark new collaborations, new discoveries, and then many problems will be solved. Thank you for your willingness to share your knowledge and working together for the well-being of the Latino, Latina, Latine community. The full video will be posted on the IMAS website soon. Thank you to the personnel at the office of President Tim Kalin for their help organizing this symposium in coordination with Dr. Stephanie Torres, assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Torres, assistant professor in the Department of Educational Psychology, College of Education, University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Torres is the organizer of this symposium and we thank her for her leadership. Her program of research focuses on ecological risk and resilience factors among low-income Latino, Latina communities, particularly Latino families impacted by immigration-related stress. Her research emphasizes the resilience and cultural strengths among the Latino community. She hopes to create a school-based and community-based programs that promote well-being and mental health while utilizing uh, promoting uh, uh, a community-based participatory research approach. Dr. Torres is also interested in avenues for promoting psychology's involvement in policy and advocacy efforts. Her clinical work has focused on addressing trauma exposure, and she specializes in serving bilingual Spanish-speaking families. It's a treasure for the University of Illinois system to have Dr. Stephanie Torres. Please. Good morning, everyone. Buenos días. ¿Cómo estamos? Bien. Qué bien. So um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Doctora de Mejia. Um, welcome, everyone, to our mental health and well-being um, among Latino, Latina, Latine 
immigrant communities. To get us started, um, I'm going to go through a few objectives of today's symposium, and then I will introduce some folks for our welcome remarks. So our objectives are, one, to discuss how immigrant-related stressors impact the mental health and well-being of Latina immigrant communities, to learn about innovative efforts in the US and Mexico to create community-based and culturally informed interventions to address mental health disparities among this immigrant community, and finally, to explore how to leverage community stakeholders and partners to empower and strengthen communities. First, I would like to welcome um, Embajadora Reina Torres Mendivil, who is the Council General of Mexico in Chicago, um, Illinois, to give a few welcome remarks. So. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here for, for many reasons. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Um, the first one is because I, I saw um, Dr. Elvira de Mejia when she started IMAS. Um, it, this is a wonderful initiative of the Hispanics uh, in, in the Illinois system to uh, precisely address these kind of issues that not only affect the Hispanic population here, but also in our country. So this is an extraordinary effort in, a, in its second year already. And the second reason that this um, uh, particular event um, touches on many issues that uh, we address at the consulate, and that's why it makes me very happy to be here, is because the issue of mental health has been one of the most persistent priorities in the agenda of the consulate since, since I arrived. And it got worse because of the pandemic. So I, um, I really applaud the effort that the, uh, all the participants in this seminar and our good friends of the Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro are making today, because you're right on target. Um, you know how complicated the issues for our community are here. And I, I'm not only speaking about the Mexican community, but the immigrant community in general. So on top of all these layers of stress and anxiety, you have the fact that many of them are really irregular or a member of their families uh, is irregular. And now um, the city of Chicago is experiencing the arrival of a lot of persons of other uh, places, other countries in, in Latin America. So what you are doing here today is very important. And it's very important because one of the um, main problems to address these um, mental health issues is the shortage of experts. So doing this in an academic context, I'm pretty sure that it's gonna target the interest of many students to specialize in this and uh, to go to the communities and work with the communities, learn more about what kind of issues they are facing and how to solve them. And lastly, I think that is very important because um, it uh, emphasizes the fact of the need of bilingual um, bilingual experts to, to, to address this issue. Um, one of the things that we hear the most in our community is that they need, they need experts that kind of speak their own language. So I appreciate that. Lo aprecio mucho, lo aplaudo. Thank you to all those experts and students participating in this symposium. And I'm looking forward to, to the next one. Thank you, and I wish you good luck in your works. All right, hopefully you can all hear me again. Apologize, the hybrid thing is new for us here. Um, thank you again uh, to La Embajadora. So now I would like to welcome up La Doctora Amalia Payares uh, from UIC, who is the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Engagement here. Welcome, Doctora Payares. <laughs> Thank you everyone and thank you to Imaz and Elvira and everyone in the team for, um, for not only hosting this and Stephanie for organizing all this, but um, also for hosting it here at UIC. And I hope um, that in my remarks I can, I can talk a little bit about uh, a question Elvira asked me to address, which was uh, Latina immigrant communities and um, mental health and UIC. Um, but I do wanna say that um, before you know, before I start that, um, you know, I am not an expert on mental health, but I do understand from teaching here for 28 years many of the stressors um, that immigrant and especially immigrant youth have around migration, discrimination, struggle for survival, uh, threat of deportation, uh, and struggle to prove their humanity. Uh, 
victories took a lot of toll from our students. Years later, uh, and Tanya was here with me, we joined other students in a five-year campaign, three attempts to pass a bill called the RISE Act, and that was very, very hard to do politically, but we did, and that bill allows undocumented students to have access to state and institutional resources. One of the hardest things was that students had to go and testify. And here, legislators say that they had no value, that they weren't worthy of resources, that they weren't worthy of an education, okay? And that took its toll on them. Uh, but they did it anyways. Some of them would not even directly benefit from it because they were already graduating. Uh, but they knew they had to continue doing this work. Um, and then we also, of course, experienced the loss of DACA and what that did to many of our students. Even as we were gaining resources, we were losing resources on, on another side. Um, and I'm proud to say that there are other things that we continue to do at UIC to a lot of advocacy in this institution, create a position and hire a brilliant person here, Tania Cabrera, to support undocumented students um, in every way. <laughs> from high school to job placement. Um, yeah, I've seen Tanya, you know, hold a, you know, hold, stay with a student for hours holding their hand while, while their father's being deported. I've seen Tanya be there 24-7. Um, I've seen Tanya now struggle through new things, you know, going from undergraduate to new goals, a professional and, um, you know, graduate students. Um, a lot of what she does engages in sort of wellness, but also making sure that there's a, you know, that we work with our mental uh, health center and that they have a peer support group and that they feel supported throughout the very difficult experiences that many of them continue to have. And I'm happy to say that in October, we are opening a much larger space, uh, uh, a resource center for undocumented students, um, thanks to the work of Tanya and those who have supported her. And I'm also proud to say that, and I, I would say in the last five years, we have done some really important hiring at UIC. Uh, we've hired many more um, Latina faculty, um, and, but also people who have expertise on Latinos and mental health, and, and, and I think that's super important that that opens up research doors, uh, you know, all kinds of ways of beginning to think collectively we had expertise in migration and different fronts, but not necessarily uh, mental health. That's a growing area, and thanks to expansions in different colleges and hiring, and very thing. And thanks personally to a, a project that's very dear to my heart, that Bridge the Faculty. We have we also have uh, someone like Stephanie Torres here to really lead the way in helping us think about Latin immigrants and, and and mental health. So so very uh, thankful for that. Um, but I also know that there's so much more that we need to do. Um, you know, uh, again, we have new arrivals in Chicago. Chicago is a center, a hub. We have been, uh, you know, welcoming center for immigrants for many, many decades, and it's become extraordinarily complicated and difficult um, uh, as we face new arrivals and new conditions. And, uh, and so the work has to be expanded and has to continue. Um, and we need to find it in our hearts, in our minds, be creative and strategic as to how we're able to support both the people who arrived yesterday uh, and the people who have been here for decades and are still struggling with so many different things and and how do we support and create professionals and graduate uh, students who actually belong come from those communities thank you so much uh, for being here and uh, excited to learn together muchísimas gracias amalia Muchas gracias. All right, so I am pleased to welcome our uh, final speaker in our welcome remarks who is joining us virtually. So we'll pause a second to help uh, change over to the speaker mode. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce la doctora Margarita Teresa de Jesus Garcia Gasca, who is the president or rectora of the Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro in Mexico. So um, again, we're going to switch over to speaker mode and then I will give you the floor, doctora. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am. I am. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to join with you in this important meeting, and uh, we have a, a, a very, very important uh, collaboration with the University of Illinois. I wrote some words for this important occasion. I want to thank Dr. Elvira de Mejia 
for her enormous enthusiasm and her great, great work with Latin communities of the University of, uh, University of Illinois and the strong collaboration with the University of Querétaro. The University of Querétaro is also uh, the academic uh, home of Elvira. Thank you very much, Elvira. Undoubtedly, the high mass program shows today it's, a, it, it's enormous, enormous potential. I, all, I also grateful to Dr. Pamela Garbus, who managed this important project for our university, for the University of Querétaro. And I am sure that, uh, it, uh, that it, this project could not be in better hands. Pamela, muchas gracias por todo el apoyo para llevar a cabo este proyecto en colaboración con la Universidad de Illinois. Emotional and mental health is a very important aspect for our communities. The COVID disease revealed it, and today we know the enormous burdens that some students carry due, to, due, carry due to different situations. In Mexico, we have uh, 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 very, very high uh, problems about mental health, mental health in our university. Uh, maybe for Latin communities in the United States, uh, some situations are related with the ch changing of the residence uh, for uh, another country. That means not only the change of residence, but also changing the culture, traditions, language, lifestyle. So uh, it, it, it is a, a very, very important charge for them. Our universities have the responsibility of working. So that, so that our communities have the best welfare conditions. So these actions are of great relevance. Many thanks to those who make it possible. From the University of Querétaro, we send you greetings and our best wishes for joint success. Thank you for allow us, uh, for, for allow, for allow us to, be this, to be in this second international symposium on, on mental health. We are very, very happy to be here. And thank you very much for the collaboration between both the University of Illinois and the University of Querétaro. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So um, now um, you're going to hear a little bit from me. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about um, some of the work that I do here at UIC, but also in general, just kind of setting the stage um, to talk about the impact of stress on uh, mental health among Latine uh, immigrant families. So um, again, my name is Stephanie Torres. I'm an assistant professor in educational psychology, and I'm also a clinical psychologist. So I come at this topic from different lenses, um, a lived experience as a daughter of Mexican immigrants, a clinician who specializes in trauma-informed care with Latinx, Latina families, as well as a researcher in this space. So today I'll be talking about the impact of structural racism on Latina immigrant families and the importance of community-engaged research. I'll start off with an introduction, including what is structural racism, how, what does it have to do with mental health. I'll talk about community engagement, and then I'll talk about the specific project that I'm working on in collaboration with a community organization here in Chicago. And then I'll end on a call to action to get us all thinking about next steps for this topic. I want to acknowledge some funders that made the, uh, this work possible, um, specifically the um, Center for Translational Science here at UIC, which is a grant award through NIH, the Institute for Race and Public Policy at UIC, um, and then also I have my clinicaltrials.gov uh, identifier here where you can find out more information on this specific project I will be talking about. So I wanted to talk about structural racism and mental health. And first, let's set the stage. And why should we care about this topic? I call this my administrator slide. Everyone here today I know is interested in this topic, so we're preaching to the choir here. But why, why should we care about Latinx, Latina? And I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, and it's because during the last decade, the Latinx population accounted for over half of the US population growth, yet continue to face striking health disparities. So we know um, here that one in seven uh, person in the US is an immigrant, 
And one in eight is a native-born U.S. citizen with at least one immigrant parent. So we think about children born here, where their parents are born in a different country. Um, we also see that um, Mexico continues to be one of the highest um, birthplaces for immigrants in the United States. And we also know, and this was especially important during the pandemic, that over 4 million immigrants work in the healthcare and social service industry are integral to our, um, our society. Right, despite all of these statistics, we know that rates of mental health problems are increasing among Latinx populations, especially depressive episodes, so depression specifically. And despite that high um, rate, 51% of individuals do not receive treatment. And there are a host of barriers for this, some uh, which I'll talk about now and other presenters will talk about later. Um, things like lack of insurance, um, lack, of, lack of status, right? Lack of knowledge or awareness of resources, stigma around mental health in our community, immigration factors, fear of deportation, fear of giving your ID at a, a clinic, right? Um, and we also know, no surprise, that Latinx undocumented immigrants are at higher risk for poor mental health, including depression, anxiety, um, and things of the like. So what is structural racism? Why am I talking about structural racism? So the definition of structural racism you'll see up here, um, and there are multiple definitions. This is the one that I uh, work off of, but it is a system in which public policies institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. So that's a lot. But thinking of that statement, think about what or who you are impacted by in your own lives, right? We know that individual factors alone cannot account for the disproportionate rates of morbidity, mortality among minoritized communities, right? We have to think across different levels. So this graph on the, or this chart on the right shows that structural racism and, and other factors too span across multiple levels, right? You have things at the interpersonal level, the institutional level, like promotion practices, community level, like racially or class segregated schools, the systems level, which is immigration. So thinking about how racism occurs on multiple levels, this intersects to constrain access and this results in health inequities. So this is why I focus on this structural level um, uh, theme because it does trickle down and impact mental health. So specifically, let's think about structural racism and determinants of health or determinants of mental health, right? So um, if we think about it in this way, Things like anti-immigrant climate, immigration policy, immigration enforcement, and divestment can be critical determinants of immigrant mental health. If you see here on the left, and some of the ways that I was even trained in um, school, in graduate school, was when we think about immigrant health research, we often look at things like nativity, so country of origin, years in the US, acculturation, for example, um, how much English do you speak, right? And we look at those factors as directly impacting physical health, mental health, and quality of life. But with that framework, we're missing all of those things in between. And so this shows the proposed pathways um, of structural racism on immigrant mental health. So specifically, we can think of structural racism in the forms of immigration policies, right? Immigration policies restrict access to health and social services. Um, Anti-immigrant climate contributes to experience of discrimination. Immigration enforcement and criminalization, things like detention, deportation, work raids, racial profiling, of course, impacts quality of life, well-being, and mental health. And then finally, structural racism can look like economic exploitation and divestment. So things such as low education, segregated schools, um, the fact that immigrants um, are willing to take low-wage work that don't have access to unions or other protection, poor working conditions, poor housing. Right, so this is the direction we need to head in and break away from the traditional way of looking at immigrant mental health. So with this in mind, how, does, how do structural forces impact you know, immigrant mental health, specifically Latine, Latinx immigrant mental health? One of the other ways I like to look at it is looking at the cumulative experiences of migration. So I won't have time to talk about each one of these, 
But what I like to say is when a student, an individual, a family walks into your office, walks into your classroom, walks into the space you are in, they carry what we like to call an invisible backpack, right? And this invisible backpack is full of stressors, um, potentially traumatic experiences, also resilience and strength from their experiences over time, right? So if an individual uh, migrated from Mexico, let's say, they carry that stress of pre-migration, why they left, poverty, lack of educational opportunities, violence. They also carry what they experienced in transit. Transit is very different for different folks. How did they get here, right? And then you have asylum or temporary resettlement, which happens for some folks and others no. For example, did they have to wait at the border um, to await an asylum, an asylum hearing in the United States, for example, right? They carry that. And then they finally get to the United States and they carry what we call post-migration stress, right? And that's the stress of just being an immigrant or a Latino in the United States. Things like discrimination, language barriers, people you left behind, social isolation, right? So all these folks are carrying this invisible backpack when they walk into the space that you are in. Specifically thinking about um, post-migration stress or that last stage of um, that uh, chart I showed you on the previous slide, um, stress due to immigration, discrimination, language challenges, at no surprise, are contributing factors to poor mental health among immigrant parents and their first and second generation adolescents. And I put that there because I am a child adolescent psychologist, so I mainly work with kids. Um, but obviously kids do not develop in isolation. You work with their parents, you work with their communities, et cetera, right? And we know that these fears, um, these stressors can impact well-being in children, in adolescents, regardless of their status, right? Parents are stressed, that kind of trickles down to the children. Children also worry about their parents, right? If their parents are undocumented, they worry, what if they get deported? What's going to happen? What if my mom is discriminated against at the health clinic she's going to later today, right? That takes a toll on folks. And in that way, these types of structural stressors not only impact the, the person who is the immigrant, but also the family processes as well. And I say this because this will bring me to my current project where I really think about these structural factors in the family context. So when we think of current interventions to help immigrant families cope with stress, right, we've established that structural racism happens in the form of um, immigration enforcement, divestment, et cetera. We know that impacts mental health, right? So what is out there to help families cope with this type of stress? So we know that existing interventions aren't well suited to address the nature, the multi-systemic nature due to structural racism, right? We have traditional mental health models, including therapy, um, including bilingual clinicians, structural assistant, like childcare to help folks come into therapy. Um, but this doesn't help the, the huge problem of how to deal with structural stressors, right? And we're also missing community voice a lot of time. Um, as a clinical psychologist myself, that's something that um, we often talk about in the field of who made these manuals, for whom did they make it for, right? Who do they test it in which populations, right? So community voice is something that is incredibly important, especially when we think of structural racism and how to help solve that uh, big problem. So that brings me to community engagement. And I wanna ask you, what is successful research, right? So as a researcher myself, as perhaps researchers in the room or on Zoom, what do we equate with successful research, right? Think about that, and then think about, does successful research equate with successful community collaboration? Oftentimes, it doesn't, right? So a lot of times in our research, we tend to have a damage-centered research approach. We think about what's wrong. We think about what the deficits are, right? What can we do to help these people? But it is our job to figure out ways to shift that narrative for, of damage-centered research to research rooted in resistance. So I take this quote from um, an article by Tuck in 2009, where they say, survivance, in my use of the word, means a native sense of presence, the motion of sovereignty and the will to resist dominance. Survivance is just not survival, but also resistance, not heroic or tragic, but the tease of tradition and my sense of survivance outwits dominance and victory. So in that way, we should all think about how do we switch this narrative 
to tragedy or you're a hero to really thinking about how do these families resist this type of structural stress, right? So thinking about re-envisioning theories of change and creating mutual beneficial roles. And that's really the, the gist of working with communities, not on communities, right? And that is CBPR. So this is the research approach that I use in my work. CBPR stands for uh, Community-Based Participatory Research. Um, and the definition is here, the collaborative efforts between multi-sector stakeholders who gather and use research and data to build on the strengths and priorities of the community in order to co-develop multi-level strategies to improve health and social equity. So what does this all mean? So like I said, this means shifting that deficit perspective and thinking about working with communities, not just on communities. So instead of kind of the helicopter research of having intervention, flying in, delivering it, seeing what happens, and then flying out, how do we start from the beginning? How do we work with community members to think about what the problem is from their perspective, what they bring to the table, what they're experts on, right? That is community-based research. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how do you take the first step, right? How do you involve community members? Um, it's really the importance of collaborating with individuals directly affected by the problem. And I've said this a lot to my, um, the folks that I work with, my community health workers, my promotoras. I might be a Latina woman who speaks Spanish, who's the daughter of Mexican immigrants, but I, I have a certain sense of privilege. I have a PhD, I went to school, I speak English, right? And so how can I collaborate with folks who are directly impacted by the problem unless instead of me thinking of this is what I think they need, right? Some of the things that you will encounter when working with community members, which is rooted in historical racism, um, preconceptions about involvement, right? A lot of community organizations, a lot of community folks have been harmed by research, have been harmed by folks kind of coming in to study you know, their community, right? They have a history of being ignored. They have a sense of, of powerlessness perhaps in, in the past. And also time constraints is a huge one, right? You as a researcher, as somebody at, you know, who wants to help and be in a community, um, has to understand that these community members might not see you as, the, as a priority, right? And that's, and that's okay, right? How can we, how can we kind of work with this? And this is thinking about taking the first step of how to involve community members. And I have a few strategies that I've used in my own research that I'll talk about in a, in a slide or two. Um, but the importance of recruitment and retention. And that's important not just for community members, but also thinking about academic you know, uh, settings as well and recruitment and retention of students and faculty and staff, et cetera. But really highlighting strengths and expertise reciprocating efforts, right? It's not just a one-way unilateral relationship. Listening, there's a difference between hearing and listening, and I know this as a therapist, but also this is just in good practice, right? Truly listen to community members. Don't just hear what they're saying. Treat time as a precious resource for the both of you. Remaining organized is also helpful. Sometimes on your part, working you know, and going into communities, you have to be kind of the one that remains organized. That sometimes means taking on more of the, of the work. And also, partnerships are based on mutual respect, trust, accountability, and solidarity. Obviously, this, this makes sense. It kind of seems like a no-brainer to say this. But truly thinking about what mutual respect, what mutual trust, what mutual solidarity actually means. And these are some questions that I wanted to leave you with, with thinking about what does shared voice and choice truly mean, right? How do we help? gain that mutual trust, that mutual respect. So thinking about what does it mean? Who gets to make decisions? How do we relate to one another? Who is accountable to whom? How does improvement happen? Even creating a shared vision and mission statement for the project, right? So this is all community building. And only after we think about ways to invite community members, think about this shared voice and choice, can the research that we're accustomed to really begin. So with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the own, my own project that I'm doing and how I kind of integrated some of the things that I just talked about into my work, which is called Fiesta. Um, so Fiesta, um, and I'll talk about this in a bit, but Fiesta stands for uh, Familias Inmigrantes Empoderándose Contra el Estrés Tomando Acción, o Fiesta. 
Um, <laughs> we'll leave it at Fiesta. So Fiesta is a collaboration between UIC and the Resurrection Project, which is a wonderful organization here in Chicago. Their mission statement you can read on the left. And this is a partnership of two years and ongoing that we use to develop our, our partnership or our project. It's myself at UIC along with a few graduate students and my undergraduate research team, and then a team of six over at the Resurrection Project or TRP. Uh, including five community health workers, promotoras, all moms, uh, Spanish speaking with lived experience um, who have children, and then a primary consultant over at the Resurrection Project. So how did we start to form Fiesta, right? This all was literally in the last two years. We just, um, you know, are preparing to kind of pilot test our project. But what did we do first? We had an assessment of community needs and resources. We thought about the causes of the problem. We thought about our end goal. So we thought about what matters to people in the community. That was a question we sat down over food um, and, and talked about. What matters to people in this community specifically? We had well-being and mental health. What's the priority issue? We talked about stress due to problems beyond our control. Something that we talked about was the impact of structural racism. They didn't say that exact name, right? But stressors beyond our control, stressors due to the system, right? Structural racism. And who is the priority population here? So for my promotoras, it was Latina moms due to caregiving roles and their youth, specifically adolescents or teenagers. We thought about the causes of the problem. So what causes stress in the viewpoint of these promotoras? policies, lack of resources, um, which kind of talks about the structural stressors, limited coping skills, not being able to communicate with your child about really tough things, right? Um, and what resources or skills would help families deal with stress? Things we talked about, self-regulation skills, so how to cope, relaxation, advocacy, empowerment, what does it mean to be a leader in your community? And then what was our end goal? Our end goal, we decided, was to create a program created by and for the Latinx community in a group format because healing happens in, in groups and relationships and having it family centered. So this slide was two years worth of work, right? And it was worth it because that's how we came up with Fiesta. This is our logo that I'm very proud of. Um, the name and the logo was designed by our community partners and then the actual logo was made by my wonderful grad student. So Fiesta is a 10 session intervention uh, that, that aims to decrease stress due to structural racism, the stressors I talked about on the other page, right? Like um, fear due to um, being undocumented, lack of coping skills, um, not knowing how to advocate in schools. Um, and this specific uh, intervention is among Latina immigrant moms and their children, specifically 14 to 17. That was a priority population our promotoras identified. All group-based sessions facilitated by trained community health workers. And this is incredibly important. Um, as a grad student, as someone who was trained in clinical psychology, I was often the one going out and doing these group sessions, which is great. However, isn't great for sustainability. One of the things about community-based research is how do we help this become sustainable even after the research is done, right? We don't want the program just to stop. So what we're doing is we're building capacity. I'm training the community health workers who will then become the trainers who will train other community health workers. So in 10 years down the line, you know, this will be fully functional, fully operational and belongs to the community, not to me, right? It belongs to folks at the Resurrection Project. Um, Fiesta also has parallel sessions, so it's family-based, but we also understand parents and youth don't want to talk about certain things with each other. So we're having separate group sessions with built-in family activities each of those sessions. So I'll take a second for you to all kind of look at our um, different session themes and titles. This was also part of our um, needs assessment. We basically thought of like, what are the things that we might need to help combat stress? They came up with themes. Those themes then became sessions. We had about 30 sessions at some point, but you know, for feasibility, we had to cut those down. Um, folks at uh, my promotoras are already talking about Fiesta 2.0. Um, so these are some sessions, um, and we can see they kind of address different things. So the first one is more of like the individual uh, level interventions like stress, what, you know, feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. What about problem solving? What do we do with negative thoughts? 
But then things such as family communication, how do we talk about really difficult topics? What is empowerment? What is leadership? You know, what is the stigma around Latina women being empowered? Immigration stress, we spent several sessions on. One of them, we facilitate our Know Your Rights curriculum, which is uh, created from uh, the Resurrection Project. What do you do if ICE comes to your door? What are your rights? What can you carry around? How do you role play, right? Non-traditional in terms of what we're used to with stress management, but we know that knowing your rights and being empowered impacts your mental health, right? Talking about advocacy in schools. So um, what's an IEP? What's a 504? What if a teacher doesn't speak Spanish and turns you away? What do you do? Finances as well. Even if you're undocumented, you can buy a house. How do you do that, right? And then our last session being more um, what they call a circle of conversation or a peace circle, which is where all family members kind of talk about what they learned and kind of have a time to actively reflect on you know, what they learned throughout Fiesta. So what are some next steps for us? As I mentioned, our pilot groups are launching next month. Um, we're going to pilot test this with 30 families. After our pilot data, we hope to scale up our efforts um, to increase reach throughout Chicago. Right now, because of where the Resurrection Project is, we're working in Pilsen, Little Village, and uh, back of the yards. We hope to bring it to the west side, like Belmont Crang and Edmosa, the suburbs, Cicero, Berwyn. You know, there's a lot of, of things that we need to, to do to help increase the reach of this. Um, I included our, our really nice recruitment flyer that we're currently in full recruitment mode um, this week um, to help recruit our families. Um, and then I have a website on the bottom. Um, if you want to follow up on our progress, um, please visit our website, floorlabuic.com. Um, we'll, we'll regularly update it um, to kind of keep everyone updated on how things are going. So what I want to end with is this. So individuals do not live, learn, work, or play in isolation, right? We're all impacted by multiple contexts. We cannot ignore structural forces at play anymore. And with that, we can't really solve a multi-dimensional problem with a unilateral approach, right? Um, and the thing I've, I've learned a lot is the third bullet. You may be the expert on the content, but the community is the expert on the context, right? So I might know a lot of things about coping skills and therapy, but they know a lot more than I do about their own community. So listen to them. And again, a call to don't work on communities, work with communities intentionally seek to shift damage-centered approaches, engage multiple stakeholders and shareholders. This is a team effort. This should not just be led by the university or the group that you're at. Lean into frustration, lean into critiques. The amount of time that I redid the Fiesta curriculum was quite a lot, right? Lean into it because at the end of the day, it'll take longer, but it'll be so worth it. Establish mutual trust, respect, and solidarity. And finally, think about why you're doing this work, right? Think about what the connection you have to this work. Be genuine and stay true to your passion. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And in general, um, we will uh, have a space for some Q&A later. And then at the end of the whole event, we'll have a panel discussion. Um, so if there are any questions, um, please save those. And then we will get into discussion later. Right now, um, what I want to do is I want to introduce uh, three speakers for our first uh, section of um, our symposium, which is on community-based partnerships. So really thinking about that community aspect I talked about. Um, how do we build collaborative efforts to address mental health? So I would like to invite up uh, Dr. Suarez Valcazar, Dr. Lopez Tamayo, and La Doctora Garbus to come to the front. Um, and we will start with La Doctora Suarez Valcazar. Um, folks, you can sit over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to hand it over to you, and then once you are finished, then we can just go ahead to Dr. Lopez Tamayo and Dr. Agarbos, okay? Thank you. Thank Stephanie. you. Good morning. Actually, my presentation aligns very well with Stephanie's presentation. I'm going to focus on culturally tailored interventions. What do they mean? How do they look like? and provide a specific example with the case of promotoras, similar to what Stephanie described. And these are promotoras that are 
trained to support the health and the well-being of Latinx caregivers of children with disabilities. This grant is being funded by U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, NICLER, and I'm a copy eye on this grant, and I collaborate with researchers in my department and the University of Texas at Austin. So a quick overview. What are some of the specific issues that Latina caregivers of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which I will refer to IDD experience? Why culturally tailored and what does it mean? I'm gonna go through a couple of models for creating culturally tailored interventions in collaboration with the community, as explained by Stephanie, and then share the example of our promotoras. So what are some of the specific issues that Latinx caregivers of children with disabilities experience? There's actually very little research capturing the experience of Latina immigrant caregivers of children with IDD. Many of them do not have insurance, do not have easy access to health care. They often care for older adults and many other children. In some of the previous studies that we've done, we show that Latina caregivers of children with disabilities experience more stress and more symptoms of depression they are the population of Latina women without children with IDD. High incidence of condition, health conditions that place them at risk, like pre-diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and other conditions. They experience structural racism. Oops, what happened here? Oh. They experience structural racism, as explained by Stephanie, limited access to resources, they also often, if the first, first generation immigrants lack information about the rights, the rights of the children with disabilities and what rights they have as parents. They often live in misstatus families and fear deportation or have experienced a family member fearing um, deportation. Low sense of entitlement lack of information that the system has provided and educated them about rights, and lack of relevant culturally and linguistically appropriate services. So why culturally tailored interventions? So most evidence-based interventions are not tested, not developed in collaboration with communities of color. They often go through a process that we call surface adaptations. They are translated, and bilingual staff are trained to deliver. But the content of the intervention itself doesn't have the cultural elements of the community. Latinx children, my families of children with IDD often experience unique needs, and more so if they are first-generation immigrants. Interventions tailored and developed in collaboration with the community are more likely to be effective. And some of the work that other scholars have done show that often the four times more effective and more likely to be sustainable over time in a community. Culturally tailored interventions promote health and well-being and also promote equity build the community strengths, and optimize community engagement, as explained by Stephanie. So let me share a framework that we use on our work that grounds our interventions. Culturally tailored interventions need to build look at how do I collaborate with the community and together develop an intervention grounded in sharp framework for equity interventions. A structural operation, like explained by Stephanie, historical context, what is the context, the history, the history of migration, of oppression, what are the conditions that impact the family at the moment? Analysis of role, 
how can my role as an investigator, as a student, as a provider, could be collaborating together and not imposing Western views, but how do we collaborate together and have the role of empowering each other? Reciprocity and mutuality, leveraging the strength. This is a critical one. Often communities of color are studying and more so Latinx immigrants, they study from a deficit approach. Look at all this bad stuff, right? We're familiar with that kind of research. We're switching the lenses here. How do we collaborate, as Stephanie highlighted, looking from a strength approach? Our families bring incredible strength to our work, and skills and abilities and interests. And how do we switch that power dynamics? So what we invite people to think about is deep, structured, culturally tailored interventions. We need to start collaborating with the community, like Stephanie explained, but pay attention to linguistic preference and health literacy levels. Behavioral preferences and ways of doing. We often expose in our communities ways of thinking, ways of doing, ways of being from a Western view, but not necessarily look at what are the ways of thinking and doing. Co empowerment, cooperation, spirituality, cultural symbols reflect the values and ways of thinking of the community. What are the values? How do they live those values? Identify social, cultural, physical, and environmental social determinants of health factors that impact health outcomes. And we need to attend that social determinants of health are gonna be different for different families, depending on their social, economic, structural environment. We also pay attention to cultural levels, acculturation, acculturation levels, recognize generational differences. That our teenagers and my sons who are second generation might not necessarily think like me or have the same ways to think it that I was born in Latin America. Format of delivery is not just training translators and training bilingual staff, but the way of learning, goal learning, group learning, metaphors, ditches, stories, social learning. And as one of our mothers keeps saying, we learn a lot from just talking to each other. So let me describe PODER. PODER is one of the three projects under this federal grant, and it's the one, uh, PODER Familiar is the one I, I direct. Our overall grant is looking at three basic components of health disparities. Detecting disparities experienced by Latinx families with children with IDD, understanding disparities, and reducing disparities. So building on the work that we've done in the last three years under study number one and two, in collaboration with the community and our mothers and community leaders and promotoras, we developed a promotora project. The project is grounded in the values of participatory strategies already described, asset strength-based approach. We move away from the deficit approach. Community center model is described. Empowerment based, and more than empowerment, co-empowerment, as we learned from our mothers. Focus on sustainability and utilization and ownership by the community. So our community partners, Grupo Salto and Bella in Texas are co-partners and they're gonna be sustaining the intervention once the funding of the grant ends. And how do we translate that knowledge that we're accumulating as researchers into real practices for agencies and community groups? So Poder Promotoras, Poder Familiar, the main goal is to promote the health 
and their well-being of Latina caregivers or children with IDD. Given all the studies done, the, but many of them have been done by our group, the stress and the issues they experience, how do we support them relying on trained promotoras? Why promotoras? The reason indicates that promotoras are trusted messengers. Here is one of our promotoras with some of the mothers from the program. They are Latin caregivers of children with IDD themselves. They have experience with the system. Their children are a little bit older. They're leaders in the community. They work and live in the same communities. I actually invited one of them to come, but they at work. They're trained to deliver the program. They're trusted messengers with experience. They're bilingual and bicultural. So Poder Familiar includes 10 sessions. The sessions are delivered online with the option of group sessions in person or online. There are three main themes in the Poder Familiar curriculum. Mental health and stress. How to manage stress, mental health. Healthy eating, healthy routines, physical activity, and navigating the environment. Using an ecological approach, I think it's important to always integrate how I'm gonna navigate the environment. Because it's often, as Stephanie explained, it's the structural environment, the physical, social environment that is often presenting a lot of barriers and challenges to our families. So let me give you a few examples of deep structural cultural components taught by our promotoras and our mothers. Linguistic preference. All materials are in English and Spanish. So mothers and caregivers have asked for both. They are all at fifth grade level. And we had all the sessions reviewed by promotora and a couple mothers and our community partners at Grupo Salto. Metaphors. They love short stories and metaphors. And they gave us quite a few examples that we're using in our manual. Brief case studies. There's some research that highlights the importance of using stories with the Latino community or mini novelas. So we use quite a few brief short cases and stories. This, is, this one I love because actually was taught to us by one of our families. So when we were early development of the materials, the grant is focused on health and well-being. So part of the health component is about healthy routines and eating and nutrition and navigating the environment and physical activity. So when we introduce in a group of about 10 mothers, my plate, are you all familiar with my plate? which is promoted by the U.S. government as healthy eating. One of our mothers raised their hand and said, Yolanda, wait a second. This is not how we eat in my community. We just use my tortilla and we mix it all up. Or my burrito or my tortilla. They love, they literally sat down with us, our occupational therapy students, and design my tortilla and start using it all over with the friends and they love it. And it was something we did not design. It was designed by our mothers. Values and ways to think it. We reflect throughout the case studies, the stories, the details, familism, which is very critical in the Latino community. Co-decision making is not about what you want to do, but how do you feel your family wants to? Co-decision making, whether it's spouse, partner, or older adults in the house, focus on family activities. Your goals for you, but also your goals for your family. And one of the key messages of our intervention to the Latinx family, especially the caregiver, is you need to take care of yourself to be able to take care for so many people. Many, one third, of our participants care for two children with autism, plus other children 
and older adults. We have a lot of stories that reflect esperanza, like that sense of hope, emotional and collective emotional expressions through short stories, and a lot of sayings and teachers. And they often laugh about those in myths. You know, we work through the myths. Attempt to culture the meaning of spirituality. It might mean different things or slightly different ways of practicing spirituality according to different families. But it's very important in many of our families and participants. Recognize acculturation levels. When we had the group session, some of the children and adolescents, even the kids with autism, would say, no, we don't want to dance to Zumba and Salsa. We want to dance to more of American music. So we saw the acculturation, generational differences. And this also helps the family and the caregiver, the mother, how to think about generational adaptations within the home and their routines and habits when they're living with teenagers being raised in America, bilingual, they themselves were raised in South America, Latin America, and with their parents, so three or four generations in one household. Ways to think in, when we introduced the idea of goals, it was a little bit challenging because the idea was more of, you know, things that I can do as a group, as a family. Um, not necessarily metas. What are your metas? No. So we introduced the idea of the traffic light system. And they kind of enjoy this quite a bit, the rad behaviors, routines that me or my family would like to change or stop. Yellow, continue, because they want to continue routines. Or green, start a new behavior, a new routine. Ways of delivery is also critical. Promotoras are trained. They play a critical role. We train the promotoras. I keep regular contact with the promotoras. We have one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one sessions, but we also have group sessions. And we notice how much the caregivers learn from one another when they are together. And they love that part. And one of the mothers said, hey, Yolanda, we Latinas are social learners. We'd like to learn from the experience of one another. Plain language, lots of visuals, and enable the social learning. So I only have one minute left. I'm going to jump quickly to meet our promotoras. Um, so one of them is Lilia Guevara, and she said, I have enjoyed being a promotora because of the opportunity to support mothers of children with special needs. I remind and teach them of strategies about the importance of taking care of their health and their well-being, creating habits and routines that help them take care of their needs so that they can, they can better care for their families. And this is Amalia, I really like helping mothers of children with disabilities. They often have very little access to support systems and they don't have time to care for themselves. Uh, we teach them how to take care of themselves and their families. To, to, go, to conclude, the needs of Latinx families of children with IDD are unique. We need to incorporate them more in research, participatory, strength-based, and promotoras are agents of change. They can really be the trusted messengers, community, agents of change. The voice of the community is critical, and that's how we're shaping our study right now. We launched the pilot about three months ago. We have 30 families enrolled, 15 here, 15 in Texas. Four have already graduated, completed the program, excited. Five promotoras, three here, two in Texas, and they continue to move on with their 10 sessions. And then in January, we're going to launch another more wide study, wider. Um, our groups, Grupo Salto, Bella in Texas, are excited because they are supporting the program. They get some benefits. 
and they're going to be adopting it and offering it to the families. Oops, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. My name is Roberto Lopez Tamayo, and I'm Lucia del Ringo Martinez. And the title of our presentation is Developing a Cross-Agency Collaboration for Trauma-Informed Intervention Services for Latina, Latino, Latine Caregivers. Uh, as you can tell, I'm an immigrant. Every, every time I open my mouth, it's a reminder that I'm in a different place. Um, yes, English is my second language, in case that you guess it. Um, and I came to this country with only with one suitcase. Uh, full of dreams and illusions. Uh, many people helped me through the process. Um, I have mentors that have been helped me uh, almost every day to adjust and to learn more. And I feel that this is my duty to also give back uh, to the Latino community for many reasons. And um, as a clinical community psychologist, uh, I feel grateful that uh, Stephanie and also Yolanda gave such a nice introduction about uh, community-based participatory research. So I don't have to uh, dig into that, although I will be commenting on that, of course. But I'm very interested in the context, the context of reception. I'm interested in developing multi-level uh, interventions to address systemic change. In Right now, what we see and everybody sees is the migrant crisis where there's people at the corners selling water, candies, people begging for money, living in makeshift um, shelters at the police stations, uh, many people jumping in to help out, many volunteers. Uh, and they all say the same, uh, we want to collaborate, they want to do something. And the question is, what can we do? Also something that they have shared is the, that despite they feel that they are providing something, they feel that they cannot do more for them since they are expressing also concerns about trauma. Uh, many caregivers uh, share their stories back in the country of, of origin uh, during their journey to the U.S. and what they are experiencing here. So yes, everybody is asking for help. Uh, uh, at first, I wanted to also say more about uh, the rest of immigrants. And of course, we want to work with all Latino immigrants. But at this point, I feel that the need also is to jump in and work with these recent migrants whose needs are not being met. So what can we do? Using community-based participatory research principles, we want to utilize the, the resources that we have at our hands to reach out and include Latino services, uh, servicing organizations to bridge the gap between trauma-informed programs and practical solutions addressing trauma and the impact of social determinants of health affecting Latino, Latina immigrants, particularly recent immigrants. So I'm with the Urban Youth Trauma Center. Um, I'm here, uh, well, you will hear also about um, more things that we do uh, from our co-director, Lisa Suarez. So we are funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health and Services Administration, and we are part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And our center is, has three goals. One is to increase awareness about the needs of traumatized families and children affected by trauma and community violence. Also to develop 
and disseminate trauma-informed practices and, and models to address uh, community violence and trauma for families, and also to provide training and consultation for those uh, community-based organizations and institutions who are implementing these programs. So using the, or leveraging on these resources that we have, we have successfully, and I'm taking it successfully, as uh, Stephanie mentioned before, uh, we successfully implemented a cross-agency collaboration in Park Forest, where we engage law enforcement, school systems, uh, also community-based organizations, and we want to replicate that in the Latino community. And for that, uh, I started reaching out to Latino service organizations, uh, some of them historically serving Latino uh, immigrants, Latino immigrants, such as Erie House, Centro Romero, um, also uh, the Latino Social Workers Organization, many members have expressed interest in also collaborating in La Ravida uh, Children's Hospital. In what we try to do is to create a collaborative approach in which we both learn about the needs of this population using these community-based participatory research principles. We also put our expertise together since we may have some resources and previous expertise, but also hearing about community members so that we can implement these programs and that are, that, that are actually culturally sensitive and adapted to their needs. There's three layers of this collaboration. Number one is to uh, create or address trauma and build community resilience by, by really doing a needs assessment with these, um, with these re recent migrants. So for that, we can bring our expertise. We have um, a platform where we can collect data online. We also have other resources. We have also undergraduate students and also people, bilingual, bicultural people also working uh, with our center that we can put together and we can put that force to collaborate with other agencies. Uh, as I'm speaking, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make justice to all these community-based organizations that I've been reaching out to and how eager they are to collaborate. And um, there's people who say, uh, for instance, Erie House, uh, tell me how many parents do you need and I'll get them for you. Um, well, it sounds easy and I know it will, take, it will take time to put it together, but these agencies are really are eager to collaborate and to help out. Also, what we want to target is the need for resources and material. This is not something new. Uh, luckily, there's information, there's resources for Latinos, but some of these information and resources are not in Spanish. So we have agencies and we have bilingual and bicultural staff that need to translate these resources for them. And that is doing some help, but Families need to take away something. They need to take something home so that they can review it, they can, and also something that is tailored for their needs. Besides sharing and promoting and creating resources, we also found the need for programming for Latino caregivers. This is not something new. Uh, many, many, Partner agencies have expressed the need or 
the, their hopes for material for caregivers. And I'm going back to, to what many volunteers have shared with me, people who are working with migrants uh, at different levels. They have, they have faced trauma, adversities at different levels. And the question, what can we do, remains. Now, the, the curriculum for Latinos, for Latino caregivers, we already have an existing curriculum that we want to take into the community. We want to run focus groups from, from different parts of the city, from different um, uh, populations too. Uh, most of the recent migrants are Venezuelans, but there's also people from South America and also other people from, uh, also from Mexico. So we want to get their thoughts, present the material to them, get their uh, feedback on wording, on examples, using dichos, um, even pictures, whatever, whatever material can make it more appeal, uh, more attractive to them. And once we infuse this, this um, feedback, then we can also uh, prepare it. But not only that, we also want to learn about their barriers and the challenges that they have when they are, uh, that they might be facing if they attended these groups. Also, we want to run um, by them what they think about some measures that we want to utilize to collect some information. So in a sense, what we try to do is to enhance communication between partner agencies. We want to empower uh, agencies by learning um, some uh, aspects of the research, but also to make it their own. So when they have this product, they have this intervention, is sustainable and they can use it not only for uh, during this time and with this specific group, but they can also use it for, uh, for other groups as well. And now I'm gonna pass the mic to Lucia. Hi everybody, hola. Um, I'm Lucy, I'm a bilingual trauma therapist at uh, the Chicago Child Trauma Center, which is housed under La Rivita Children's Hospital. Um, since this is talking about cross-agency collaboration, I just wanted to hop in to see um, a little bit more of how we can apply this to actual agencies and actual families. Um, as I think we all know, a lot of bilingual clinicians, bilingual healthcare workers often do not have as many supports available for their Spanish-speaking clients um, as we do for English-speaking clients. Um, right now, there's a huge influx of refugees with really high levels of trauma, um, and it's really causing an increased need for trauma-informed services. Um, and there's large gaps there where we don't have enough bilingual clinicians um, to meet a lot of those needs, or we don't have trauma-informed services to meet a lot of those needs. Um, and I think emphasis on the trauma-informed services, right? Like there's um, other services out there, but they're not always trauma-informed. They're not always taking into account um, the levels of trauma that these families are coming into the country with or are arriving and experiencing once already in the country. Um, it's really challenging to find these supports, these services um, for families. And like Roberto was saying, particularly for caregivers and parents, um, I think there's there's some support for children. I'm a children's therapist. I, I work primarily with children. Um, but then those caregivers, I feel, um, I found are really lacking supports for themselves. Um, and that's a gap in treatment that we are trying to, um, to resolve here. Um, recently, I've been collaborating with a refugee house um, and seeing this influx of refugees. Um, and we're just seeing, again, like I said, really high levels of trauma, um, really high levels of need. And like Roberto was saying, these agencies are, are in desperate need of supports and they're really eager to participate in these things, um, eager to get trauma-informed services, eager to get Spanish-speaking services. Um, but I think we all are recognizing this need, but we're trying to see where to tackle it from. Um, like, where are the gaps? How can we support these families that are, are coming in? Um, like I said, I, I work with a lot of immigrant parents, um, and I really love this quote. Um, immigrant parents with their wings cut still teach their children to fly. 
Um, Because we see a lot of parents coming in with really high levels of trauma themselves that are really, you know, came to this country to see their children thrive um, and are doing everything possible to make that happen. Um, I'm having parents come in trying to sort through their own symptoms of trauma while trying to support their children. Um, Their children might have some supports and they're kind of on their own there. Um, As a therapist, it's really essential for caregivers to be involved um, in treatment. There's some interventions like child parent psychotherapy um, and other frameworks that essentially caregivers are directly involved in treatment, but in other modalities, we still need caregivers to be a part of that. Um, At the end of the day, I can do a million things in my office, but if that's not being translated to the home, if that's not being translated to the wider community, um, we're not seeing changes, we're not seeing symptom reduction in children, um, and these families at the end of the day don't have all the supports that they need. Um, So what can come from these collaborative focus groups that we're trying to implement um, is just making available resources accessible to families, right? There's a lot of Um, barriers to accessibility that I'll talk about, Um, linking families with not only individual but group services. I was really excited to hear about some of the group interventions that you all have already mentioned um, that I think would be great resources for some families. Um, Also creating and distributing psychoeducation materials um, and then connecting bilingual providers across agencies. I'm the only bilingual provider at my agency um, and I, I met Roberto at a conference and Um, was just so eager to work with other bilingual providers and have those supports across agencies. I think we each have different resources and if we all collaborate together, we're more likely to make a difference and we're more likely to feel supported ourselves as providers. Um, Some of the potential obstacles is hierarchy of needs, right? Refugees are coming in with really basic needs not being met, right? They're being housed outside of shelters, um, wherever they can um, find something for themselves and some of those problems need to be addressed before we can you know, tackle trauma, tackle mental health, um, things like that. Um, also, like I was talking about access, right? Um, parents need childcare support, they need transportation support, there's language barriers, all the things we already know exist, um, but how do we overcome a lot of those? I'm seeing refugees come in, they don't have a phone, how do I contact them, how do I schedule a session? Um, how do we get them where they need to go? Um, things like that and then particularly when you're working with parents right what do they do with their kids there's a lot of single moms coming in um, who need a lot of support in order to make this work so focus groups is such a great way for um, for us to to listen like um, was said before right to what are the needs of this family how can we overcome a lot of these obstacles in order to truly meet the needs of the family and not just implement things that we think might be helpful without listening to to them first Thank you. I'll pass it back to Roberto. The, this is the last s- slide, and it's for you to read and reflect. Um, migration is an expression of the human aspiration for dignity, safety, and a better future. It is part of the social fabric, part of our very makeup as a human family. Um, Thank you for, uh, for being here. Thank you for those who are uh, uh, following us uh, remotely. And I hope that w- what we share here with you also resonates and also can make or promote change. So everybody has something to do um, uh, for um, recent migrants, but also for the Latino community. Thank you. Okay, yes, you can hear me? Okay, hello, thank you very much for my invitation. I would like to to thank all of you who who organized this, such an import event, but uh, especially Dr. Elvira, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this, for sharing this with me and invite me. It's, it's a honor for me to be here with you, uh, listening all your great jobs with Latino 
uh, families. Uh, it's it's really really uh, great for for me to to listen. What are you doing? I know all of you or, or are doing this job because are doing this research or these actions because uh, our history is too. That's really really important to to do something to those who are our community i have my own experience of uh, migration i i live in mexico but i'm not from mexico i live since the last 12 years there but i'm from argentina so i can understand with all the difference, but I can understand what that experience means for the families, for for our careers, for for our children, for our families, um, original families. So uh, I'm really um, conmovida. I don't know how to say this. So I, I will try to to speak slowly. I would like to say sorry for my English. I will try to do my best, but I can understand you very well, but talking is more complicated for me. So, well, I, I'm trying to, to think uh, with you, what can we, we do together from different uh, university, different um, countries, but uh, I would like to start talking about mental health and well-being. What, what do we mean when, when we talk about mental health and well-being? Why research and intervention in Latino, Latina, and Latine uh, university students mental health matter? The reasons for development and international network of university of researchers what is what i am proposing for you and how can we start i really appreciate all my colleagues who speak before uh, to me because uh, all that they they shared with us uh, are the, the fundament for what I am trying to share with you now. When we, when we talk about mental health, I try to uh, make a focus on a positive definition. Um, as the WHO said, it's a state of, a state of well-being in which a person realizes his or her capabilities and can cope with the normal stresses of life, work productively, and contribute to his or her community. When we think about Latinos uh, students, when we think about Latinos immigrants, we can see how this definition uh, it, it took itself uh, really, really relevant. No? How can we deal with the normal stresses of life, but which is the, the normal stresses of life in this population, in our population. So uh, if we think in a positive perspective, we think that mental health is not about absence of, of illness, but it's about seeing it as the foundation for well-being and the establishment of healthy bonds to the community. These healthy bonds with the community was, I think, uh, all of my colleagues were speaking before to me, and that's why mental health is so important and why a positive perspective to work on it is so important. Mental health and wellness are funda fundamental because give us the ability to share our thoughts, our feelings with others, to express our feelings, to generate a, a productive exchange with society, and therefore 
to enjoy life and enjoy life with others, with others' community, with, our, with others' um, students. So it's really important to think how all this experience about migration, about to be a student, um, take a specific um, characteristics because of their own history. So, uh, uh, okay. Mm, okay. So, uh, mental health brings us the chance to be a contributor to our community, but to receive the benefit of belonging to it. Mental health refers to our emotions, psychological and social well-being, and is a socially and psychological determinate phenomenon. I would like to, to share with you these um, three components of mental health, social well-being, emotional well-being, and psychological well-being, which all of these are um, dimension, different dimension in which we can work, we can research, we can de de uh, design actions specific to our um, community. So, why research and intervention in mental health of Latino, Latina and Latina student, student uh, mothers? Okay. Being a university student no longer mean being part of a population exempt from vulnerabilities. No? They are exposed to a variety of risk factor. Vulnerability increase in Latino university students who unfortunately are burdened with other kind of vulnerabilities that my partner, my colleagues mentioned before. But beginning the university lives coincides with a specific period of development in young people. For example, individuations, progressive separation from the family, new social connections, increased social demand for autonomy and responsibility at the time when these capabilities are still being consolidated. Consolidadas. <laughs> the brain is undergoing accelerated development too. This is from all of our university students. They are exposed to new risk at the university environment, like psychological stress or recreational drugs, alcohol, bad sleep habits. So we need to think also that mm, most of mental disorders emerge in South and they are used to have a substantial delay in treatment and treat uh, or inadequately treatment. Uh, mental health is associated with uh, progression to more complex disorder school drop out addiction and self-harm this is for mm, this is what university students uh, are exposed to but it's a high risk peer of maladaptive coping emerge of psychopathologies academic failures and we can um, we can mention two uh, dimensions about adapting to new environment, which is psychological and sociocultural. So, when we think all this condition in our Latino university student, we need to think also that they are vulnerable due to the factors related to 
events such as family experience of drastic cultural changes as our uh, colleagues uh, speak before, uprooting and lose of significant family ties, experience of rights violations, lack of economy and social opportunities, contrast between the culture of majority group versus their own culture of origin, stigma, discrimination, adverse experience linked to migration. So we have all of these um, events and we have all of being a university uh, means to these uh, students. So that's why, why I think we, we judo, we, I, I would like to uh, develop an, an international network of university. Mm, first of all, collaborative students between university with Latin students here and Latino students in, in Mexico will favor the understanding of the risk and protective factors of migrant students. The difference between these two um, uh, population, I think they could give us the chance to uh, understand what the experience of migrant means for this um, population specifically. It would also favor the development of knowledge about conditions shared by Latino students, regardless of their place of the students and residents. What that being a Latino student means living in Mexico, living in Chicago, Illinois. It will allow the generation of knowledge on the care and promotion of the mental health of colleague students. It will favor the design and application of action strategies for the care and most important prevention, prevention the mental health in problem student. It will improve the training of students of the university, of course, Latino students. And it will also improve the training of teachers and researchers of the different university. How can we start doing it? Well, I think we can invite those colleagues who knows, who, who we know uh, can be part of this network, inviting other universities here and in Mexico, but with a concrete proposal for the network, arguments, goals. And I think to, to make a, a network is an important thing. But the most important thing is how to consolidate it. So I think um, doing collaborative studies will strengthen the, the network through the exchange of knowledge and experience in students, in, with the students, with teachers, with the researchers. So I think we need to start doing things to develop a network. No, develop the network, then start doing things. So what can we do together? How can we do it together? Why is that important? Why mental health? I really, really appreciate that this um, IMAS uh, program put the, the mental health on agenda, because you know that um, all the world suffer a pandemic, uh, which has a very, very important effect on economic, on health, on 
um, a, lo a lot of aspects of our lives, but mental health was really, really um, the most important, um, I don't know how to say, inesperado, uh, unexpected, yes, sorry. But um, we already before the pandemic, we, and I, I, I say we because I know it's a problem in the whole world, we have really, really lack of opportunities uh, to prevent a mental health problem, to promote the mental health, and to care those about who has problem. That was the, the um, situation before the pandemic. When we have this pandemic, we realize how many years we have lost, how many recourses, and how this event will impact not just here with us or with other young people, but we think that we have to do something now because we are losing years of health, years of mental health in this um, a specific young people. So I think young people are not the future, they are our present. So let's work together to improve their mental health and well being to increase the opportunities for personal and professional development. Thank you so much for your patience by my English. Okay, thank you everyone so much uh, for that great, uh, those great presentations. Um, we are now going to take a break. Um, it is 10.53, we'll break until about 11.15. Um, for folks who are here in the room, there is food, coffee, juice over there. Please go ahead and help yourself. For folks on Zoom, um, go ahead and take your own, your own break. Um, and we will meet everyone back here at around 11.15 for our second portion, which is talking about innovative models for Latina mental health. Um, and then we will have a panel discussion and closing remarks. Thank you again. Okay, everyone, welcome back uh, in person and virtually as well. Hope you had a lovely break and some good conversations. Um, so right now we're going to move into our second portion, uh, which is innovative models for Latino, Latina, Latine mental health treatment. We're going to switch things around a little bit. Um, but first, I wanted to answer a couple of questions that were in the chat. And then I will go ahead and have a Dr. Suarez Dr. Agustafan and um, 
Yesenia Cervantes come up and present their portions. Um, but before that, we had a couple of questions that I want to answer now. Um, somebody in the chat asked about the impact of immigration trauma on first and second generation folks. Um, I'm happy to, to take that question. I know our other presenters also might have some other uh, thoughts on it. Um, so immigration trauma, um, is one of those things that I talked about during the different stages of migration, right? So we can think about immigration trauma as pre-migration trauma, which is trauma that occurs in your home country. So things such as um, the traumatic impact of poverty or violence, <clears throat> domestic violence, for example, are some things. Um, we can also think about immigration trauma en route, right? So we've heard stories about folks crossing um, the border on La Bestia, which is the train that goes through Central America and Mexico to get to the United States. Um, we also have to talk about immigration trauma that's per, um, perpetrated by our, our governments. We think of the uh, recent um, buoys with spikes on them on the Rio Grande that was done by uh, Texas in terms of just immigration trauma, right, and getting to the United States. Um, and then we can think about trauma that occurs here. Um, so racial discrimination, you know, can absolutely be a trauma. Uh, we can think about, you know, community violence here. Um, deportation is something that we have seen um, a lot, especially as a clinician. So thinking about, you know, if a family member is deported or detained, the impact of that on that person and on the people that um, are around them, like their families. So in terms of the, the impact piece, you know, we can think about it as cumulative, right? So oftentimes immigration trauma is just not a one event. It's complex. It builds up, it accumulates, and it impacts, you know, mental health. You can think about things like um, problems sleeping, problems with routines, depression, anxiety. Um, you can think about like increased startle responses, so jumping when there's a noise, right, out of nowhere. Um, having the thoughts in your head you, you can't get rid of. Like all of these things impact not only, you know, first generations, but second generations um, as well. So thank you for that question. Um, the second question um, would be for um, Centro Romero. So I think he might have just stepped out to take a call. But um, I don't know if you have any information on that. You can come up and speak to. But one of the questions was just expanding on the involvement of Centro Romero um, in the collaboration, so the second presentation that we, uh, we discussed. OK. Okay, we'll hold that question for later because uh, the person is uh, taking a phone call. Apologize for that. Uh, but that will be one of the questions on Doc. If anybody has any other questions, please send them in the Q&A section. Um, and I will go ahead and read those at the end of our uh, discussions when we'll do our panel. Okay, so now I would like to introduce uh, la doctora Lisa Suarez to come up and start our innovative models uh, section of our symposium. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Muchas gracias. It's an honor to be here. I am <clears throat> originally from Puerto Rico, but I've lived in Los Angeles, Boston, and now here in Chicago, so I can relate to the issue of connecting mental health to transitioning and immigration. I'm very appreciative of this symposium that has been put together. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about understanding and addressing the needs of Latina youth impacted by trauma and substance use in the U.S. border region. And I want to highlight some collaborations that I have in a site, a residential substance abuse treatment site in Laredo, Texas, right at the border in between U.S. and Mexico. Cool. Here I am again. So wanted to acknowledge the funding that supports the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, most of the work has been supported by SAMHSA as part of the work with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, the first one was out of Boston University, down at the bottom, um, but more recently funded at UIC through the Urban Youth Trauma Center. So I am going to talk about four topics, and I have labeled the slides with these four topics so that you can follow along kind of where we are. I want to talk about trends for adolescents, for Latina youth, and the special case of youth in the U.S.-Mexico border. 
I'm gonna talk about links between trauma and substance use. I'm gonna share with you information about this integrated treatment approach and our adaptation in collaboration with our partner site in Laredo, Texas. So trends. Um, more than two-thirds of children and adolescents are estimated to have experienced a traumatic event by the time they are 16. Um, in terms of PTSD diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, the prevalence rates estimate from 5 to 13 percent in the population for adolescents and children. And then in terms of abusive dependent or problematic use of illicit drugs or alcohol, the prevalence is about one in five to um, adolescents ages 12 to 17. For substance use, the rates are much higher, about half more or less of the youth um, at, uh, use drugs or have tried it. Um, in terms of the connection, studies show that as traumatic stress levels increase, so do levels of substance use. Trauma exposure is associated with increased risk of early substance use, as well as the development of PTSD, depression, and other comorbidities. <clears throat> and because of the systemic oppression and <clears throat> institutional racism that was discussed earlier, um, this comorbidity of trauma and substance use affects ethnic minority youth at disproportionate rates. So for example, because of the conditions of inequality and adversity and poverty, um, ethnic minority youth are exposed to a greater number of certain traumas. They're also overrepresented in the juvenile justice system, despite the fact that there are similar substance use rates in the population and in times sometimes lower. And there is a disparity in terms of service utilization and quality. So Latinos are less likely to access the services and utilize them, and when they're offered, oftentimes they're not evidence-based or they're not adapted for language and culture. And despite the numerous barriers that immigrants face to successfully integrate into the U.S., recent immigrants tend to do better on a number of health, education, substance use, and crime-related outcomes, and this has been labeled the immigrant paradox. So there are lower rates of substance use and problem behavior among foreign-born versus U.S.-born Latinos. Um, substance use rates increase with lengths of stay, so the longer somebody has been in the U.S., the more likely it is that the rates match those of the U.S. population. So they kind of go up to be up to par with citizens or, or people in the U.S. that um, have been here all their lives. Um, immigrant females are at greater risk of internalizing problems, whereas males are at greater risk for externalizing problems. Um, and as I mentioned, there are lower rates of service utilization, but particularly among foreign-born Latinos. And one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that we need a more nuanced understanding of immigration beyond immigration status or where people were born. So we need to better understand um, cumulative stress, acculturation, trauma, exposure, access to, to supports, and other things like that. In terms of this, um, the U.S., the youth in the U.S.-Mexico border region wanted to share with you some information about context. So youth residing in um, that region are impacted by numerous threats to safety in their neighborhood um, due to criminal violence as well as drug trafficking. There are many risk factors stemming from adverse environmental conditions in the Texas-Mexico border, including substantial geographic isolation. There are also sectors of extreme poverty, a shortage of services and resources, um, and there are also higher rates of alcohol and substance use among adolescents in border communities. So the drinking age um, in Mexico is lower. Kids go over to the border um, to drink. And finally, traumatic separation has been a big issue, especially with the um, immigration policies in the U.S. Um, so let's talk about links between trauma and substance use. We did a large study comparing two national data sets um, to understand the difference between 
um, adolescents who only had one of these two conditions, so either PTSD or a substance use disorder. We compared them to people who had both trauma and substance use and learned that those with that comorbidity had greater number of traumas, higher clinical severity in terms of internalizing problems, externalizing problems, substance use severity, traumatic stress, higher functional impairment in terms of home, community, relationships, and more involvement with different service systems like juvenile justice, child welfare, special education. There are also <clears throat> these three pathways that we know about that connect trauma and substance use. The high-risk behavior pathway tells us that youth who have substance use problems engage in risky behaviors and therefore <clears throat> are more likely to experience a trauma, like driving under the influence, um, hanging out in our, in our safe neighborhood to buy drugs, um, being high at a party and then getting assaulted. Um, this acceptability pathway um, tells us that kids or people with substance use problems, when we compare them with those without a substance use problem, they're more likely to develop PTSD following a trauma because the substance use disorder is associated with certain coping deficits that make you more susceptible to developing PTSD. And then the pathway that most people are familiar with is the self-medication pathway where people experience a trauma, they have a lot of distress associated with that trauma, and then they self-medicate to um, alleviate the, the distress. Stress is associated with initiation of use. Once you've started, people are more likely to continue under stress. And once they've stopped for a little bit, they're more likely to really relapse under stress. So if we think about trauma as a magnified form of stress, you can imagine just how strong that relationship is. <clears throat> I also want to talk to you about another link between trauma and substance use that has to do with stimulus response relationships. So trauma and substance use have in common the notion that a stimulus or signal <clears throat> leads to a conditioned or automatic emotional reaction that then leads to a conditioned avoidant response. So in the case of trauma, somebody who's been sexually assaulted, for example, encounters a trauma reminder. So she is in a situation where there's somebody who looks exactly like the person who assaulted her. All of a sudden, she's flooded with these automatic and uncontrollable reactions of what, she, what happened to her and what happened after. Could be sadness, anger, anxiety, guilt, shame. And people, in order to alleviate these reactions all the time, they develop these automatic conditioned avoidant responses. It could be dissociation, could be self-harm, could be risky behaviors such as substance use and other things. <clears throat> in the case of substance use, when somebody has a substance use problem and they encounter a situation that reminds them of the context of their use, the people, the place, the time of day, a commercial, all of a sudden they are flooded with this reaction that's intense, physical, physiological, as well as psychological that we call craving. It's very unpleasant. And the best way to get rid of it is with substance use, right? So it's a very strong link. <clears throat> and what we have learned is that people who have both trauma and substance use problems, when they are encountered, when they find a trauma reminder, they actually, instead of having that intense condition, emotional reaction, they go directly to the craving. And then it's more likely for them to engage in substance use. So it's even harder to address because they don't even experience that the trauma is bothering them anymore and they really perceive that the substance use is helping. And so it's important to understand that in order to provide help and assistance. The other thing that's really important to understand is the context. So I have here a list of risk factors associated with trauma and substance use. Um, and a lot of the previous presenters have talked about this before across the individual relationship, community, and societal spectrum, thinking about structural racism and all the things that the lack of resources, the separation from the host country and all of the, the rich family support that somebody could have. 
Um, I also want us to think about the flip side about the resources and the strengths, particularly for Latina families, and how it is important that we harness those strengths. And when we are thinking about intervention, we build upon them, that sense of family, that sense of um, identity, we can sort of tap into that so that we can help them overcome the distress that they're dealing with. So transitioning to talking about intervention, <clears throat> I apologize. Um, when I was at Boston University, we were tasked with developing an integrated intervention um, to address um, trauma and substance use for adolescents. It was uh, a specific NCTSN grant for that. And so we looked at the available interventions and their components to address trauma and substance use for adolescents at the individual level, as well as the family and broader systemic level. And the resulting intervention is an adaptation of trauma systems therapy. Um, we call it <clears throat> TSCSA um, as the adaptation. So we worked with the developers and embedded components that are evidence-based for trauma and substance use within this framework. And so TST, or trauma systems therapy in short, is about a trauma system that includes a traumatized child that has difficulty regulating emotional states and a social environment or system of care that cannot help contain this dysregulation. And because of it, interventions fall into two dimensions. We have social environmental interventions that are meant to operate through and in the environment to increase stability and support. And we have self-regulation interventions to help the individual um, deal with the stress in a less than perfect world. And these are the three components of the original TST intervention. And I'm going to share some of our adaptations for substance use real quick. Um, the safety focus module, um, the goal is to um, provide safety and stability and building the capacity of those around the child to help and protect them. I and mean, this is important because many times we jump into skill building and helping people regulate, which is really important, but we have to assess and potentially address any current environmental threats to safety that may still be going on and different adversities that may, might get in the way of people adjusting and dealing with things. So some of the components um, specifically for substance use um, include motivational enhancement as well as some family-based and skill building components. The regulation focus is more in line with the cognitive behavioral approaches to build skills and we have added a lot of psychoeducation and self-monitoring as well as different skill buildings and helping to manage triggers and cravings throughout. The final module is about learning to address the trauma. The main component is that trauma narrative, but we have embedded um, relapse prevention and other um, strengths and tools to manage um, cravings as well. So in terms of our adaptation, in outpatient settings, we, it, the intervention was originally divided, um, developed for outpatient settings, um, but we have worked with this partner side to adapt it for a residential settings so that all the interventions can be delivered within the typical 12-month stay. We screen all the youth for trauma, even though the, the population is seeking services for substance use, you'll see how important it is that we are addressing trauma for everybody regardless. We provide psychoeducation and skill building elements in a group setting that they get multiple times a week, and then goal setting, skill building, trauma processing are done as in individual sessions, and we do the parent-focused interventions through a multifamily group, and now with COVID, um, there's a Zoom involved as well to connect with the families. So the partner site is called Serving Children and Adults in Need, or SCAN. I worked with the male and female residential facility. They serve 19 counties in South Texas, so a big area. <clears throat> and we've been working together since 2006. We actually went session by session to evaluate the curriculum and see how it was going and adapt it for the needs um, um, of the population and also translated everything into Spanish. <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of the findings, <clears throat> oh, 
almost all participants reported at least one trauma. The average trauma was six and a half, with girls significantly <clears throat> higher levels of trauma. And I'll illustrate a little bit more deeply if you can see. I don't think you can see. It's too small. But these are the different types of traumas. Blue are boys, orange are girls, and gray is everybody. And the ones that have a little asterisk are the ones that girls were significantly higher. So girls had significantly higher school violence exposure, interpersonal violence, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and sexual assault and rape. So to summarize, we learned that trauma exposure is the norm among the substance abuse treatment seeking youth that girls experience higher rates of trauma. Oh, thank you so much. God bless your heart. This is what I needed. Self-care and community care, so thank you. <laughs> um, girls experience greater rates of trauma. The number of traumas is related to PTSD symptoms and substance use cravings. Um, and then in terms of implications, it is very important that we assess and address trauma exposure and its effects, that we address the links between trauma exposure, trauma reminders, and substance use cravings. So in my consultation, we talk about these links all the time. We want to understand how specific trauma reminders and cravings are linked to dysregulation. We want to understand and address those contextual factors associated with substance use and help them so that they can do well when they're discharged. Integrated interventions that address a range of problems are preferred, <clears throat> and problems, programs should be prepared to address differences um, to connect to the needs that are specific to boys versus girls because they have a different experience, they express themselves differently as well. And in terms of future directions, um, we use the UCLA PTSD Reaction Index as well as the Children's Report of Exposure to Community Violence. And we found a lot of trauma. But we also learned that that measure doesn't capture the potential experience for kids in that border region. And perhaps it might be a similar experience to the families that are coming in um, to Chicago with their interactions with immigration um, and these practices that are inhumane and the different things that they might be subjected to. So just wanted to put that into context so that we can think as we help and support students and youth and families impacted by the experience of immigration, um, which is a wonderful journey, but it's filled, can be filled with a lot of strife and sometimes inflicted um, by the very systems that we are part of. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and looking forward to hearing the other speakers. I, I guess we're still in buenos dias, not buenas tardes yet. But uh, <laughs> we're excited to be here with you all. Um, ah, here we go. Um, so my name is Erica Gustafson. I'm a clinical psychologist here at UIC, and I'll be co-presenting with Yesenia, as you can see, the mic will go up and down, <laughs> up and down. Yesenia Cervantes, uh, Director of Community Workforce Development at Sinai Institute. And between the two of us, you're going to be hearing some different perspectives on community health worker models for Latin A mental health. This is with a specific focus on the immigrant community, um, both from the research side, the practitioner side, and also just from uh, a personal investment side um, as a daughter of an immigrant. And uh, yeah, this, this is an important topic uh, for, for all of us here. So in terms of the objectives of our talk today, you're going to hear a little bit of a research perspective from my end. I'll be pulling in some uh, data from a systematic literature review, focusing on what role can community health workers play in mental health service delivery. Um, and then we'll hear a little bit about, <laughs> yeah. And from me, you're actually gonna be hearing about some implementation projects that we have going on that we started developing two years ago. Yeah, um, yeah so, so you're gonna kinda get two, two perspectives today. Um, to get us started, I'm not gonna spend too much time here. A lot of our prior presenters have done a great job laying this groundwork, uh, groundwork, 
But just to briefly reiterate, when we think about immigrant mental health, there's a unique constellation of factors that are important to keep in mind. Right? There's the unique stressors that Latin immigrants face across the migration experience from before migration, during migration, after migration. Um, and that then butts up against uh, a range of treatment barriers, ranging from stigma. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I've often heard from some patients, pero no estoy loco, eh? Um, and you know, the various other attitudinal um, hesitancies related to treatment, and then also more systemic ones, like we've heard um, related to lack of providers, lack of access due to insurance. And ultimately, that culminates in less access for Latin immigrant communities. So we know that immigrants, Latin immigrants, use mental health services at about half the rate as their US born counterparts. And then, as was previously mentioned, uh, when they do access services, they're less likely to receive, receive guideline concurrent care, meaning they may get into treatment, but the quality of those services maybe isn't aligned with evidence based treatment, which is also a concern. So ultimately, this becomes an issue of access to care, um, and it highlights the fact that our standard models of mental health care are falling short, right? Many folks who need help and support aren't accessing services. And so this is what led to uh, our interest in community health workers, or CHWs. Um, they are known by many different titles, so you may have heard promotoras de salud, lay health workers, home visitors, lots of different titles there. So that we're all on the same page about what we're referring to, um, we're just gonna briefly reference the American Public Health Association's definition, um, which defines a, a CHW as somebody who's a trusted member of the community served or somebody who has a really close relationship with or understanding of that community. And so this is a really unique workforce, as has been highlighted with some of our earlier presentations, in that it's a workforce that's defined by their social positionality as members of the community served. And that could be members of the same racial or ethnic group, or it could also be a community defined by a shared experience, um, such as people who are dealing with the same health issue or something like that. Um, and so CHWs have been most commonly used in things like patient outreach, patient health education, service navigation, um, but there's growing interest, as we've seen from our earlier presentations, in bringing CHWs into the mental health, behavioral health space. So, um, and there's several reasons for this. Uh, there's, there's a range of strengths and benefits to CHW models. Um, given that they're members of the community serve, they're really well positioned to mitigate and address some of that stigma as, as a near peer to clients served. Um, they're also really well positioned to increase engagement in services. A lot of times within the immigrant community and also other communities that are systemically left out of traditional services, we see that when folks are seeking help, they tend to first look within their community, look for informal sources of support. Um, and rather than first going to say a, a mental health provider in a hospital or something like that. So CHWs, by virtue of being in the community, are better positioned to engage people. Um, and it's also a strengths-based approach, right? We're investing in building capacity within communities, building on the resources communities already have, namely their people, right? Um, and that can help address some of these barriers such as mental health deserts, and ultimately, it increases and diversifies the workforce, right? Um, by investing in community members to be able to serve their fellow community members, we're creating a more um, diverse workforce with more, more capacity to, to treat folks in the Latin immigrant community. So this is all well and good, um, but what do we know about these CHW models in the mental health space from the literature? Um, and I'm gonna be presenting a little bit more of a bird's eye view rather than a specific intervention. Um, what I'll be sharing with you all is some preliminary data from a systematic literature review that I'm conducting um, that really centers on these questions of what's the evidence for CHW delivered interventions within the Latin community here in the US and what are some of those cultural and contextual factors that are relevant in these models. Um, this review is registered in Prospera, should anybody wanna look, look that up. Um, in terms of methodology, for the sake of time, I, I won't spend too much time here, but basically we followed standardized PRISMA guidelines, um, 
doing a standardized search query, search query uh, having a review team going through systematic review stages for data extraction and coding, and then our inclusion criteria are there at the bottom. And basically we were filtering for articles where CHWs were the ones delivering the mental health intervention, targeting a Latin community population, and um, targeting a mental health issue. So in terms of the data, those are the screening stages there on the right. We ended up with 32 articles in our data set representing 30 studies. These are those articles listed here. Um, and I'll be kind of presenting some key takeaways from, from this data set. Uh, and one thing I'll just highlight here is that two thirds of the studies um, in this review focused on immigrant populations. Um, so we're already seeing that these CHW models have high relevance within, within this community. So what did we find? Um, in terms of what types of interventions were delivered across the literature, we saw a mix of um, mental health only interventions and physical health interventions, so or a physical plus mental health combination program. So that could be things like diabetes management plus anxiety management or something to that effect. Um, in terms of what uh, mental health targets were, were addressed, we saw the biggies were really depression, stress, and parenting, and then to a lesser extent, some of those down below. And the treatment components that were delivered across studies mainly were psychoeducation, coping skills, behavior management, which refers to things like positive reinforcement, praise, things like that, um, relaxation, things like um, mindfulness, deep breathing, and problem solving, with the, those below being a little less common. Um, and here what I think is important to highlight is that in these models across the literature, we're seeing promotoras, CHWs being leveraged to address common mental health challenges, right? They're not addressing, say, acute suicidality or eating disorders, things that require, you know, kind of higher specialization. They're, they're addressing these common mental health difficulties and they're delivering information and skills-focused interventions. And that really makes sense given the nature of the promotora role um, that, that they're delivering um, yeah, these kind of more concrete, still evidence-based treatment components to address these common targets. The next piece of data that I want to highlight is the topic of tailoring or adaptation. Um, basically, how do we take treatments and modify them to make them most relevant for the community served? Um, what we saw across the studies in, in this review was that all of them were delivered in Spanish or multiple languages, including Spanish. They were delivered across a variety of settings and some interventions were delivered across multiple settings, so that's why they add up to more than 28, but the biggies were home visiting programs, community-based programs like at community-based orgs or um, in churches or libraries um, or via phone or telehealth. So we're seeing that a, a really common modality here isn't necessarily your traditional clinic-based service model. They're, they're more flexible. And then in terms of cultural tailoring, 90% of the studies in this review reported some degree of cultural tailoring. Um, and some of our earlier examples touched on, on these different ways in which cultural tailoring can take place, right? So things like aligning with cultural values like familismo, respeto, or faith, um, addressing topics that are relevant to the Latin and immigrant community, things like acculturative stress um, and parent-child language barriers, and then also uh, using culturally relevant techniques, things like cuentos, sociodramas, using those modalities to better deliver information or intervention content. And so really in these models we're seeing that Cultural tailoring is the norm within these CHW-delivered mental health interventions. And that's really a strength to these models when we think about traditional mental health care services that often that's a gap in, in more traditional treatment, that lack of um, Spanish services, that lack of um, cultural alignment with values and norms. Um, so that's really a strength here. And then the last piece of data that I'll present to you all is the outcomes, right? So do these CHW interventions work when we look across all the studies in the literature? Um, the short answer is yes. What we found was 76% of studies showed significant mental health improvements. 
Um, of the studies that reported satisfaction, not many of them did, but of those that did, 100% reported high satisfaction. And of the studies that reported treatment participation, attendance, 85% um, reported high rates of engagement. So ultimately what we're seeing is the CHW intervention, mental health interventions are effective. They're acceptable. Folks who receive them seem to like them and, and enjoy participating in them, and they're engaging, um, which again is another strength of these models given that access to treatment is such a, a challenge and issue um, within the Latin A community and the Latin A immigrant community. So on the research side, the, the kind of main takeaways I, I hope folks walk away with here is that CHWs, who again are, are folks from the community that don't have advanced degrees necessarily um, or uh, certifications as mental health providers, but with some training and support, they're able to move the needle on mental health. They're able to um, support community members in improving their mental health in these common mental health challenges. And there's some considerations that we have to take into account in terms of, okay, well, how do we do that? How do we train folks? And Yesenia yeah, will be speaking to some of those components shortly. Um, but it can be done, and it can be done effectively. And then secondly, these CHW models um, are really much more accessible, or appear to be much more accessible um, by virtue of being more flexible in their delivery format, by virtue of being more culturally relevant, and that's reflected in the higher participation rates that we see um, across these studies, which again is really relevant and, and significant for the Latin immigrant community who so often is left out of or is unable to access traditional mental health service models. So, with that in mind, uh, how can we advance these models locally? Uh, Yesenia will be speaking to that. Thank you, Erica. And I might not have the answer, but I know what is going on at SUHI. Uh, Yesenia Cervantes, again, Director of Community Engagement. How did I end up in SUHI? It's a very good question, and I ask that myself, having a background doing workforce development for 20 years, working in the Latino community, how did I end up in a hospital? Well, good question, and I think the part of that addresses why I'm here. Um, seeing my parents passed away in the last two years and not having a lot of people that look like them, that speak Spanish, I noticed a huge shortage of mental health, um, health professionals in general. And with that said, that's what moved me. I started working at SUHI two years ago, and now I'm doing incredible things, I believe, with a bunch of researchers and colleagues and doctors and people who's really committed to advance um, and address the health disparities. So having said that, I'll move to the next slide. What is SUHI? SUHI is a nonprofit organization and it's also the arm of Sinai Community Institute uh, that it's right in between North and South Landale. We have three main strategies. Uh, it's research, evaluation, and intervention, as well as innovation. I'm part of the evaluation team, innovation, innovation intervention. Um, and being in existence for the last 20 years, SUHI is trying to build up different interventions that addresses the needs of black and brown communities. Um, so they've been around. We've been around for the last, for the next, the last 20 years. And two years ago, in 20, well, three years ago, in 2020, SUHI decided after the pandemic that, it, that we needed to go beyond just addressing the health disparities, but also addressing the mental health disparities that the Latino and the African American were going through. Uh, we decided to create career pathways uh, to address those needs. Uh, we developed a workforce development board that includes people from hospitals, from clinics, from uh, the city colleges of Chicago, from universities to come together and be a think tank where people are able to think and address and propose solutions uh, to address the needs specifically in mental health, behavioral health. So we decided to do a research-based focus intervention to help community members um, improve their mental health. Overall, as far as the scope of work, we decided to create a comprehensive curriculum uh, to address the symptoms of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic syndrome, deliver mental health first aid, and help the students that were going through our classes to become mental health first aid coaches. Uh, we also are teaching them about substance abuse, comprehensive training and outreach, trauma and education, 
and also crisis prevention, behavioral activation, and anything that is related to mental health uh, resources and supportive services. We started doing this two years ago, and we have three goals in mind. One is a workforce development professional. We wanted to make sure that we're not just providing people with a certificate of completion, but that we're also helping people move up the economic ladder by finding jobs, by assisting people to find real jobs that pay well-paying wages, uh, and hopefully a career pathway that it doesn't end in community health work. So job opportunities that people can pursue after they go through our training program, our community health workers, uh, position, promotoras de salud, peer support specialists, rehabilitative services associate, case manager, navigator, the sky is the limit. One day I'm looking forward that we can have a title that says mental health, uh, professional mental health community health worker. Um, they, they go through a training program and we're trying to have them go and receive um, an industry recognized credential. So far what, we, what they're doing is they're going through the core skills training uh, for community health workers. As you might know, the state of Illinois doesn't have an approved curriculum for community health workers, but there is a curriculum that is certified at the national level. We make sure that our curriculum is in alignment with that structure. Um, we're also providing them with mental health first aid. They go through our training and they become certified on that. They do a lot of motivational interviewing and gain credentials on that. Uh, CPR, mental health, uh, first aid, and then also rainy, raising awareness on substance abuse. Um, things that we provide our students with is supportive services, as everybody has mentioned, um, and Erica as well. The community health workers are trusted members from the community who might not have a high level degree. Nonetheless, they have the trust, that connection, and the understanding of the members within the community. Um, so this is our mini project, mini uh, model that we have. This is expanding, uh, but overall our students go through 40 hours of community health work core skills training, a very uh, comprehensive curriculum that includes cultural sensitivity, motivational interviewing, community engagement, and so on and so forth. 40 hours, that's in alignment with the federal curriculum. Two years ago, we started doing workforce development, so we added up an assessment component to make sure that everybody that goes through our training program, it's in their heart and their soul and the spirit that they wanna do two things. One is assisting the community that they live in, and number two, that they wanna have a, a long-term career in the health industry. Uh, so that's the assessment piece. On the other side is the mentor-mentee uh, matching we also decided that the importance of having people team up with experts on the field, we're asking mentors to at least have two years of experience being uh, in the mental health industry or being in the community, community health worker, navigator, et cetera, so that the students have somebody to go to during class or in the program, and hopefully that they develop a long-term relationship, somebody that they can go to in case that they want to advance in their career. Uh, we also offer additional 12 hours of core technical training. We learn through the, through the different two cohorts that we have done so far is that the students need a lot about developing rapport. Rapport not only within the community, but also creating strong relationships with the healthcare uh, professionals. So our, a lot of the 12 hours are built up into building up rapport, strong relationships with the healthcare professionals in other clinics, other universities, and, um, and other resources. And then we called, we designed what is bridge number one. Uh, bridge number one in behavioral health is really 40 hours of training where our students, our community health workers, are learning about anxiety, depression, post-traumatic syndrome, behavioral activation, and so on and so forth. I wanna mention that students that go through our classes so far 80% of them are incumbent workers, is people that has been on the field at least for the last two years, and 20% of them are actually residents in the community that want to pursue a career in healthcare. That happened two years ago, things are changing. We're moving forward to having more community members, two teams at SUHI, one that is gonna be taking care of the incumbent workers, and then another team that is gonna be trying to bring people from the community and starting from the bottom up, baby steps. Um, and I'm looking forward to have English as a second language soon. <laughs> we don't have that yet. Um, 
SUHI is part of what I mentioned. They wanted to make sure that whatever we're putting into practice is making sense for the community and that, um, and that um, is based on evaluation. Every single program, every single intervention that we create is actually um, evaluated. So briefly, I just want to touch upon the employment piece. And maybe from this slide, I want to say that after the students completed the class, we learned that at least 90% of them were employed after graduation. Um, these are the different job titles, and I'm not going to go through that, but this is basically the, the job opportunities that, they're, that they've been able to achieve. Then from this slide, I want to mention that the average post-graduation hourly wage is $22.35, which is great for someone that has a GED or high school diploma, we believe, right? Especially um, comparing to other entry-level jobs. Um, in terms of achievement coming from SUHI, it's not only the fact that we have graduated since last year 85 students, um, all of them from the community. I want to mention at least 70% of them are Latinos, 30% African American, big majority is females. Uh, and then one important thing to me when I was doing those assessments is that at least 70% of those who are pursuing our, our program is people who wants to develop a long-term career in either becoming a therapist, a psychologist, or a registered nurse. Very, very important, and yet they don't have that letters, right? So that's, that's very important for us. Uh, the other thing is that we have a group of stakeholders who are working with us very tightly. We started working with them a year ago. Now we just got letters of commitment for the next two years. We got a big grant, $3 million grant investment, and we're looking forward to expand our services to other communities still targeting the Latino and African American communities. Um, okay, so the last six months we did uh, homework with the advisory board. This has been such a, a rigorous homework, <laughs> a, a, a lot of hours invested on here, but basically from the partners that we have in the advisory board, some of them are hiring uh, in behavioral health and as you might think, and others, others have alluded as well, um, there is a lack of letters of career pathways for the Latino, for the, the minorities, commu minority communities. What we found out is that there's a lot of jobs, as you can see on the bottom, the low skill, semi skill, middle skill, advanced skills. Most of the jobs are right on the bottom, low skill, semi skill high school diploma, GED, what we found out is that sh there's a shortage and there's also a gap of career pathways as well as academic ladders that help our students who are community health workers advance and become either therapists or the registered nurses that they want to become. Those two gaps, those two boxes that you see there is the, uh, there's no, we didn't find much information about associate degrees, people in positions in the health industry that have an associate degree or people that has a uh, certificate. So our homework for the next two years is really figuring out what those, how can we fulfill those gaps? Um, what will be the ac academic ladders? One thing that we decided to do is that we wanna focus our next bridge. As I mentioned, we have bridge one, right? It's overall behavioral health education. In the next year, we're gonna be developing a bridge two that is gonna be separated into two different areas, one being substance use, and the second one is mental health trauma informed. And just listening to your presentation, Dr. Um, Suarez, you totally brought up a lot of light to, to these conversations that we've been having. So anyway, um, that's what we're planning on doing. As far as reflections for the work that we've been doing, there's a parallel that we want to pursue. We want to make sure that at the same time that we're addressing the disparities of health, that we're building up letters of success, letters of economic development for our communities. That at the end of the day, there's more people that is bilingual, that is bicultural on the other side, not only as patients, right, but as professionals that can help us out on mental health and general health eh, overall. Um, community health workers have a significant interest in pursuing mental health careers. We just need to build up the career pathway ladders uh, for them. So I want to say that that's it. Thank you so much.
Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation. Um, I think one of the key takeaways from this is that mental health is, is a public health priority. Right, and it can't just be addressed on an individual level. We have to really think of different ways, different spaces and places in which we can combine our efforts, right? This is a collaborative, this is a team effort. Um, and every one of us, mental health or not, can play a pivotal role. Um, I wanted to thank again, uh, La Doctora de Mejia and IMAS for helping uh, organize this event. Take care everyone, saludos.